without anything flying out of it. But well, what I would like to do is once you've got yours apart, look at some of the other benches because you get to see a much more dramatic change from bench to bench on the size of clutch packs based on what transmission this thing went into. So just like before, have a clean spot on your transmission. It's more critical than anything else that you're not piling this up on dirty parts. Now I know these transmissions are never going back in the car, but do bear in mind that when you start building these, you don't want to start putting transmissions together to have little bits of grit and gunk in there. Because as you can imagine, there's hardly any clutch in there. And if there's some little piece of sand or rock or something that goes in there that first time it applies, it's just going to cut a big old groove into it and chew up your clutch. So cleanliness is very important for this, this part. Okay, so just like before, a screwdriver is your best friend. Um, I was looking for my one with a hook. I like that best. What you'll find is almost every set of instructions for pulling snap rings out like this, the manufacturers just show a screwdriver. You know, like my poster, it says this is not a pry bar. Well, all my repair instructions say this is a pry bar. But what I do is I do have a vent or a, a um, drawer in my toolbox of just transmission tools um, at home. And I've got about five or six screwdrivers that I just turn them into snap ring screwdrivers where they've got little hooks drilled into them. Some of them I actually made the tip a little bit sharper so we can dig into it, just for specific ones. But for our case, the technique you want to start getting used to is don't just dig into them, about 45 degrees, so a little bit of an angle. And if you just start to twist them side to side, see how I can get it to pop in there? Now I actually have access to it. If you just try digging straight down, it doesn't work. If you go too steep, it doesn't work. It's that 45 degree angle that makes all the difference where you can pop it in and then get this guy to come out. Okay, just like before, you're gonna pop the snap ring out, flip it over, get your clutches out, lay them out upside down. So if you remember from the picture we were just looking at, the first one to come out, what makes it different? Making a big thick one, right? So if they ever get mixed up on the table, keep in mind there's usually a really thick plate all the way on the end. So I'm going to pull that out, and as we do that, do a little inspection. So just like we were talking about on Monday, if you look at this one, what do I have on it? Some grooves, right? Not super smooth, although this is my, I just went into first gear. My other clutches may look a little bit different, but I have an awful lot of surface area, but a little bit of grooves to try and get the fluid out. Same thing, we'll do a little inspection to pull them apart. On this guy, I'm looking for two things. How flat is it? And is there any burn marks on it? How shiny is it? This thing actually looks like it's never really been used. It's got most of its, this little uh, cross hatching to it. Something else I often do when I build a transmission in here for a customer car. Is that the cross hatching? Well, they, they have this kind of irregular scuff all over it. It helps hold the fluid, it gives it a little bit better grab. But uh, if I'm building a customer's transmission, I like to know how flat they are. Around here, the flattest surface that we have is actually that DCM right there, the head service machine. The table that it floats around on is machined about as perfect as you will ever find anything um, around this college. So if I take this over there and I set it on that table and I'm able to rock it, I know that the thing is thin. And I probably am not gonna wanna use that plate. The table's a little hard because there's no way this table is flat anymore. I don't trust that as, as far as I kick this thing. But we'll go ahead and do a disassembly. Lay it out on the table. And then my last one, you can see, has a little funny shape to it, just like the first transmission, no different there. But same thing, I flip them all upside down as they come out, so I know that's just how they tuck back in. When I get down here, I'm gonna have the same thing. I should have a wavy spring to it and my bell bell spring on the bottom, my reset piston. Dig in, 45 degrees again, you can see how easy it is to dig that out. Try a different angle, you can see it just, it just doesn't work. Okay, same thing. Well, no, that's perfect, that's how it's supposed to be. This is part of why I keep track of which spring went where, because if I put this on top, I'm not gonna get the reaction I want. Are you serious? Yeah, this has a very consistent wave to it. This is, in a lot of ways, Huh? like an accumulator. It has to squeeze this thing, it fights the piston back, gives me a better flight. If I put a flat uh, slap snap ring in there, I'm gonna get a harsh engagement. It's gonna bang into gear a little bit when I get into the driveway and try and put it in gear. Specifically? No, I just inspect it. 
kind of. If it of looks thing. relatively consistent all the way around, you're in good shape. Of course, when in doubt, throw it out. Okay, same thing. I'm going to take this out, put it on upside down. You can install it upside down. If you do that, I can promise you it is going to burn up your clutches. Okay, and the last piece, what was this guy down here? Piston upright. There we go. I'm working on terminology. We're getting better. Take the piston. The best thing to do is you may be able to pull them out, but I typically go in there and I just start twisting as I pull them out. A lot of times that puts a little bit of um, dynamic motion on it and you're less likely to have it stick on you. Now in here, there's nothing left to do, so we'll set it aside. And on here, very carefully, pull your seals out. Now what I want you to start doing this time, last time we pulled them out and put them back on, but pull them out, same thing. You see I can run my fingernail across this. Nothing's catching. And what does that tell me about it? It's not really good. Yeah, right? There's no tears or nicks or things that I can't see. So I'm going to take that out, set it down. Same thing with this. There's another one in here. Yeah, give me just a minute. There we go. Same thing, I just want to run my fingernail around it, make sure there's no nicks in it. Now, if I'm reusing a seal, that's what I'm going to do. But if I got a brand new one, I usually don't do that. I'm just going to install it and not worry about it. But if I open up a transmission and my only goal is to do an inspection and replace the one broken part, I like to check them just in case. You know how much this thing costs? They're nothing, they're cheap. If I go to Napro, I can get a seal kit for a specific piston, they'll sell it back. It's a couple of bucks. That's pretty cheap when you consider how much your labor you charge to get into this transmission. If, if I charge three and a half, four hours to pull a transmission out, and another two hours to pull it down, you're already looking at seven hundred dollars in labor. What's five dollars for a seal? A customer won't even blink at that. Yeah, might as well just replace them all. Okay, so we're gonna pull them all out. And the last thing, look at that. That's my little check ball in here. That's what stops centrifugal force from reapplying the clutch by accident. Okay, so here's what I want you to do on this first step. Take some more time to look a little more closely at the parts. This is a good opportunity for that. But tear your clutch down until it matches mine perfectly on this table. Oh boy. Some of our transmissions require this. I actually have a couple where we don't need this press, but this is one of those. You're gonna find your set might be different than mine. What I mean by that is, you're gonna have a much larger central piece, and you may not have one spring. Here's the good news, if you got one of those, they come up much smoother and much more carefully. They don't get any of that, that weird twisting and turning on this thing. However, if you do have um, one of these springs, just come up real careful with it. Okay, just like before, we're gonna do exactly the same thing. Get your set in there and make sure that the snap ring is facing outward so you can get to it. A couple of weeks ago I had a couple of groups where they had turned the little teeth towards this and make it really hard to get in there and open this thing up. So just start developing that habit of getting your snap ring out where you can get to it. Also, once we start pressing down on this thing, I'll just remind you again, it's more comfortable to choke this thing in there so it's like it's not going to slip off, but again, you got to have some space for that snap ring to be able to come out. So towards the edge, as even as we can get it, and then compress just enough to get the snap ring out. I think I actually need a little bit more. There we go. Going any further than just enough to get the snap ring out just loads this thing up and you're asking for even more. Okay, who took my snap ring pliers? Oh, okay. All right, we'll shoot this over towards PJ there. I deserve it. <laughs> oh, come on. I told you, you're getting lucky. They're fixing my floor. It's the guy that chips it next. It's... Okay, so just like last time, I know there's some things you can't see from far back. But when I was taking this off, I actually had a finger through the core, so if it popped, it would catch it. And I simply do that, not because I don't want it to hit somebody out here, that's a pretty good reason too, but if these things go flying off and across the floor, you may end up on the floor of your shop for a half an hour trying to find the snap ring flyer that landed in somebody else's car and has already gone out the door. So I try to keep them from escaping on me. But just like before, I'll take this out, set it over, 
very carefully lift this thing up because this piece may try to catch in the snap ring groove again. Damn. It's a big ass screw. Yeah, they keep getting bigger as we go. Alright, so. <laughs> I just want to point out I didn't laugh at <laughs> This isn't built flat. Okay, I've got my spring out. Now you can take this out to start like I did, or you can wait until you get your clutches out. It doesn't matter. But uh, just like the last time, when you take this thing, nice sharp angle, 45 degrees works best. And you dig a little bit and out they come. All right, here's a good example for this. This is how it came out. What's wrong? <laughs> Upside down. Upside down. It should have gone in this way, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know what group put it together. Unfortunately, I don't keep the records. Maybe I'll start putting it on there. Del Pino built it. <laughs> but because it was this way and the snap ring was holding the edge, it's only a matter of time before this started to deflect. This thing would have started to burn up the clutches. So thick plate as far away from the piston as you can get. This one's going to go back together right this time. And I want to inspect all my clutches so in and plates. In this case, if it would have, it would have been started the way that it was, <coughs> the, the, the plates, the plates were reversed. Well, this transmission was undoubtedly <laughs> torn apart, you know, a year ago, last time I did this class. And when that group put it back together, they were probably on YouTube or sleeping when I was saying five times, which plate goes on the outside? The thick one, right? The reaction plate. Nobody's going to make that mistake tonight, right? Sure. I got volunteers, great. Okay, and the last thing, pull your piston out, pull your seal out. Good to go? Alright, let's go for it.